SIP episode 102, and it's all about rosé. There has been an explosion of rosé in the last 10 years, and we're all thankful for it. And tonight, we have Lise Asimont of Dot Wines to talk to us about every form of production there is. Sit back, you will laugh and learn. Welcome to episode 102. Uh, I do want to welcome the angels here. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels, a direct-to-consumer wine company focusing exclusively on Napa and Sonoma limited production wineries. The best thing about these wineries is you look at the back of the bottle and it's, look, mom, no barcode. No barcode because these are not in the distribution system. They are not going to be found at your local stores or your big box stores. They're all from limited production fantastic wine people like we're going to meet this evening. But I want to compliment the angels because several of them had the opportunity to really go behind the scenes last week. And, and that was new to me because there was actually a hashtag called BTS, which I had no idea what BTS stood for. I'd look that up because I'm old, uh, but that stands for behind the scenes. And they did. They got to go behind the scenes. And the first stop we had was our first guest this evening, where we were treated to an unbelievable discussion, tasting uh, of all things related to dot wines. But they also got to, and I'm going to show some pictures here, go to see what wine country is all about. Uh, so this is the Motley crew here. And this is one where all of us were actually looking at the camera, except maybe one person, the dog. Uh, it was amazing. And there's all sorts of people in here from around the country that visited with us. So we're excited about doing that. This could be an annual trip. We were able to take them and film this is the great Tom Rinaldi, who we filmed for two specific wineries. And Tom, for those of you that may not know, was the founding winemaker at Duckhorn, had 22 vintages there, really put their paradox, their decoy, and all of those different skews on the map. He is now on his, coming up, I think, his 50th vintage. Pretty impressive. Uh, but wine country treated us so well, and the angels are very fortunate to have been able to travel out there. It was, I think, trip 56 for us, so we're closely getting up to 60. And speaking of which, this is SIP episode 102. So now the angels, we call them our heroes, and yes, it is 102. You told me it was 102. I'm going with 102. Stop, stop, stop talking in my ear, please. Um, so... I talk about heroes and we heard this on the trip several times because the small limited production wineries were telling the folks, thank you so much for supporting us. It's you that buy the wines, you that actually make a difference. And that's what the Cellar Angels heroes are to us. I've said this for a while, you know, going back to Aristotle days and stoicism, hero meant something different than it means today. There is no one wearing a cape. These people, you, the Cellar Angels heroes, are protectors and defenders with the strength of two. That's what it meant 2,000 years ago. You are the wine heroes. You are the ones that we refer to as sipsters. You are the one making a difference. And when you buy from Cellar Angels, when you then repeat those purchases from these wineries, you make a huge difference. You are the ones that are exceptional and you are exceptional supporters. And keep that in mind because the root of exceptional is exception. And, and you make it an exception to buy from these folks. You make you go out of your way oftentimes. You hit the Cellar Angels website. You sign up for their emails. You don't walk the store aisles. You, don't, you aren't grabbing things in bins. I mean, that is special. That is very special. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Now, getting back to the discoloration of my forehead, uh, I did not possess the responsibility as a child. I thought I had the hair cover, that I would be fine, that... that I would not have to worry about sunscreen. I had to worry about bullying with those teeth because I could turn a log into a box of toothpicks like nobody's business. But still, fast forward to high school, didn't have a problem with the hair. I had a problem with the sunscreen. So that, I promise, will be the last time you get to see those pictures. But I wanted to share that with you because if you want to experience this, go into the kitchen, grab a cheese grater, rub it on your forehead a couple of times. And, and that's exactly what we have going on here. Eric, I said, hello, Eileen, hello. Now I want to say hello. And and the person who is going to elevate her to, I wonder if I can elevate you, Lise, or you can you elevate yourself? Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Lise because uh, Mission Control apparently just got pulled away from the control booth and got a phone call that seemed to be emergent and had to take. So I'll show you another picture 
uh, of the trip. Because when you have angels in wine country, you have to take care of them. So we put out spreads like this. And um, this is a nice little treat. And so we would love to elevate Lise right now. Uh, and hang on, Mission Control is coming back in the studio. So let's get our guest here. She's been patient. Took a phone call. Okay. Uh, Karen, hello to ever Karen. You are going to elevate our dance, Martin. <laughs> I'm like a monkey, Jeff. There she is, okay. ladies and gentlemen. Hey, aloha. Lise Asamont from Dot Wines. Now, I'm going to beg her forgiveness for the lengthy introduction. Uh, this, Sorry, I am I am drinking Lisa's rosé because this episode is all about rosé wine. And rosé has exploded on the scenes in the last seven years. When we owned the wine store, it was a very difficult sell between 2007 and 2013. People still associated it with white Zinfandel and that pink drink and men shied away from it. But oh my goodness, were they making a mistake. And we have one of the best producers of Pinot Noir Rosé this evening. So Lise, say hello to everyone again. I will toast you, cheers you. Uh, it's so good to see you. Aloha, everybody. So good. To, oh, I got a drink. It's, um, it's not, it's bad luck. The pilot goes down unless you drink, so. Mm. Thank you. I, I like that. Yeah. So I want to, we'll get into the methods of Rosé and its explosion in popularity, but I, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit because while Dot Wines is fairly new on the selling of wine, you are by no means new in the vineyard production and where the grapes come from and where the magic sauce starts. So walk us through kind of your indoctrination into uh, grape growing and viticulture. Yeah. So this, this, I believe this is vintage 26 for me, if you count my internships. Um, wow. And yeah, which is exciting. And I can just only assure you, I, I kind of feel like I'm just kind of getting my feet underneath me with the vineyard industry. Um, as a viticulturist, every vintage is so different and everything gets, gets thrown to you. Um, as a winemaker, I do feel, I, I kind of feel a little more confident with my age, which is an interesting phenomenon. Um, I'm here because I didn't want to be a doctor. So both my folks were physicians and, um, and the color that you see is, is, is not a, a tan, it's, it's genetic. So I'm Filipino American and the, um, it was a really interesting um, situation where I wanted to be a doctor just like mom and dad and went to school for it and had a bit of a young person's uh, life crisis and decided this wasn't for me. And my clever father recommended um, winemaking because um, he just really wanted um, free, um, free wine in the end. And, and it worked. Um, I went to UC Davis for my uh, master's program in viticulture. When I was there checking it out, I realized I really aligned much more with the viticulturists um, and the viticulture department. I'm, I'm sort of that, I'm sort of that rugged outdoorsy type. And so when right. you're that way, you tend to gravitate more towards that. Another big reason why I love viticulture, I, I love being a winemaker, but I, viticulture really was my first uh, love. And it's what I received my master's from UC Davis in is because in viticulture, it's farming and you are at the whim of mother nature. So, you know, you're at the whim of mesoclimate, you're at the, the whim of, if, are we getting the rain, are we not? In winemaking, it's really interesting because we, I can control so many parameters. I can turn up a tank on temp, I can turn a jacket down, you know, I, I, can, I can do all sorts of things. I can add acid if I need to, you know, I, I can, don't want to talk about it, but I can add water if I need to. So right. these are the things I can do, but with viticulture, it's really taught me to um, kind of roll with it. You know, you got to ride that wave and you can't really change it. Um, so master's from UC Davis, um, went on to work at Cambria as, a, as an assistant vineyard manager that overseeing 2,500 acres of a vineyard. Where, that was a big lesson. Where, where was that? Cambria. So Cambria at the time was technically owned by Jackson Family Farms. And the head of that was Barbara Banky. So she's the other half uh, to Jackson, uh, to um, Kendall Jackson. So she's actually just Jackson's wife. So I, technically my first job in the industry was for a very strong, independent woman. And that, that actually was pretty eye-opening for me. And she was quite kind to me, to be honest. Um, and well, did, she, there, did, hmm? she seek you, did she seek you out? How did that come about? 
No, it was kind of interesting. Her team sought me out. They wanted, they want, they basically wanted somebody seemingly overqualified to give that region credit because it was Santa Barbara County and they were seen as less academic. So they pulled me and I'm, uh, the, I might be the rugged outdoorsy type, but I'm also that super geeky sciencey type. And, uh, um, and so that I sort of fit the bill for that. And it was, a, I, I learned so much from that job. It was pretty awesome. From there, I went to work um, with the Geyser Peak Winery team for about six years. Um, and that's when they were owned by Jim Beam. That was really illuminating. I learned the big winery game and, and what it's like to have, you know, your big brother's an 800 pound gorilla called Jim Beam White Label. That taught me a lot about sales and distribution. Um, and at that point in time, the entire state of California became my classroom, which was really nice. From there, um, I moved so when, on. When you say your, your classroom, you were traveling up and down the entire state of California, going to vineyards. Yeah, yeah going to vineyards. And so, um, I, it's there's a certain way to say it. I, I, I'd like to say I speak North Coast, Central Coast, Big Valley, and South Coast. So that those were the languages, but it was all California language. Right. And um, I became multi-state and international when I joined the Francis Ford Coppola Winery team as okay. their director of grow relations and viticulture. And I was with them for about uh, 12 vintages. And that's really where I got to work on wine programs in Italy and Germany and France and Spain. And I got to um, work in Oregon. I did, I never, um, and then after that, I kind of, I dabbled a bit after I left Coppola in a couple different jobs that brought me a little bit of Peruvian, um, Croatian, Estonian, and, um, and Washington language, which was more languages wow. I got to learn. And, um, and then I launched DOT. That, that is quite a, a background and tutelage and dirt and, and vineyards and... Oh yeah, a lot of soil. Many, I, I like to say I have this, the soil of, of many continents on me. I only have the soil of 10 vineyards in my hair right now from today, but I have the soil of many continents in, in my book. So. so when someone hires you as uh, the viticulturist or over the grower program and some of the, the titles and positions you've had, what is it that they're attempting to do? Are they... A, building a brand, B, trying to resurrect or revitalize a brand, C, position a brand for sale. I mean, what? why do they grab yeah. you and, and the skill yeah. set that you bring? Well, the, the, um, so everything you just mentioned actually is exactly what I do at my current position, which is as I'm the vice president of girl relations at Foley Family Wines. So that we're okay. big, international and we're huge. Um, and, and yes, the answer is yes. Also acquisitions as well. Um, my specialty is sustainability and regenerative agricultural practices, usually used for the means of sustainable farming. However, I am, I am adept at organic farming practices as well. Mm -hmm. And my other, um, a second talent that I have is I can reverse engineer wines. So let's say we're talking about this beautiful dot Cobus Rosé. Um, if you gave this to me and I sat down with you as my winemaker, um, I would study you, I would study our current asset holdings, and I know uh, many different languages of many different regions, and we would determine if our currently held vineyards are appropriate to produce this bottle of wine, or if I have to go out somewhere else and find it, and then I reverse engineer that through vineyard cultural practices that I guide that grower through, so that's okay. language or it's talent two. And then talent three is um, I had a, I've been uh, fortunate to work for larger wine companies or even larger um, institutional funds, believe it or not. And so the language, the money, the language of money uh, is, is something that's very difficult for winemakers and farmers, viticulturists to really understand and put into practice. And that's a part of sustainability, in my opinion. And that's also one of my talents. Well, and that leads me to like nine other questions, but I want to say hello to Julie, Jim, Hi, and Scotland, who were also all on the trip last week. And I apologize, there is no International Space Station sighting this evening. You will just have to rely on what we saw last week, which we got to see the ISS four times or something like that over the course of two nights. But how do you balance the, the economic argument with regards to, you talked about uh, regenerative vineyard management against kind of the spreadsheet analysis to where someone might say, well, if we tear out the, or, or reduce the rosé program and maximize the Cabernet or Chardonnay, it's a much better economic decision. Oh, you go with it. Uh, you don't have to do that at DOT because I'm tiny and we're precious and small, but that with a larger wine company, you do that. Um, it's, it's a, 
um, throughout the different positions I've held in the in the wine industry, I've learned what my value set personally is, and I cannot work with people who I deem unsustainable. And part of that is being reckless with money. Um, it just drives me absolutely crazy. Um, and I've seen this sort of unsustainable um, uh, vineyard economic models in everyone from, you know, the hollowed halls of, of Napa Valley itself all the way to, you know, more um, commoditized farming uh, places down in the South Coast. It's right. these sorts of things that happen. It, it, everyone, everyone does this, unfortunately. Um, so that's really a value set. And for me, at a larger wine company, if that decision is, look, we're going to need to minimize the rosé program and maximize, you know, our, our still wines programs, uh, let's go for it. Um, and I think a good viticulturist realizes you're never done learning. Every vintage that comes, it, 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 it kicks your ass, pardon my language, can I say that? Um, so it, it, we'll, it, hurts. We'll it kicks bleep it out. Time. It kicks your booty. And, um, and, it, and you learn so much from every vintage. And so that also is a part and parcel with our dramatically dynamic economic models that are currently uh, dying in the United States. Right as a, a recession and everything we're looking at. So, you know, it's, I could talk for hours on this, but it's seriously one of the most boring sides of me, but to me, it brings me joy. So. Well, and I think it would be interesting, the, the dichotomy and the balance of what your professional requirements are versus your personal love of vineyards. So if there is a big production facility and you're, let, let's be honest, you're working for one of the largest and, you Ooh. know, they said, they say we're going to rip out this vineyard. And you're like, I understand the economics, but man, that's a gorgeous vineyard. And oh, and so, that's that, got to be pain. That's got to be bittersweet. That, well, if you guys want a little inside look into Foley, um, that doesn't happen at Foley. Oh, good. Uh, oh no, good. Bill, Bill Foley's at the helm, and it's still family owned uh, for now. Read into that. Um, and um, and when you and you sort of um, no, he's actually he's you have to make a. Um, a, a terribly watertight case to um, uh, get him to authorize you to pull out any vineyard. And with good reason, it's um, at this point in time, it used to be, we used to be able to redevelop vineyards or even develop a vineyard, you know, from, from, from virgin ground, which doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, from about like 30 to 35,000 an acre. That was at the beginning of my career, you know, the late nineties to now, I mean, I'm, I'm praying we can get it in at 65,000 an acre. That's amazing. Yeah. And they do, to his credit, he has specifically acquired very strategic uh, parcels and wineries, the most recent being Silverado over in Napa and from the Miller family. And, and they have some amazing vineyards and the solo Cabernet program is off the charts. So uh, you're I, certainly validation there. You're right. They pinpoint laser accuracy, what they're going after. Uh, that's terrific. And you've been there how long now? Um, uh, seven months. It Congratulations. Years. Yeah, it's, I, I've worked on more acquisition projects at Foley in seven months than I did at Coppola for 12 and a half years. Jeez, it's incredible. Yeah. So yeah. when you, when you move over to DOT and you, and you, for, and you, you this have this vision or what was the vision of here's the Pinot Noir I want to make, or here's the Chardonnay program I want to make. How do you first capture the romance of your vision and get it into a strategic business plan how, so, how do you do that here, i'm gonna i'm gonna kill my background because i'm gonna show you how i capture it so one second okay um hey shawnee you got a second cool so this is how i capture this is my this is my kitchen and this is how i capture the romance so this man is the romance this is sean phillips my husband yes so what i need to do is i have to create wines that makes make him happy that's honestly, that's the model. That's the style model. And it's our true North. So Sean does not like overly oaked wines. He doesn't like overly malolactic acetobutyl ridden wine. So butter the butter. Um, he's uh, very sensitive to oxidation or texture. So, you know, I'm not going to be doing a cherry project ever. Um, and, um, and, and he also is very sensitive to alcohol integration. Now he doesn't know it, but being married to this man for 20, 12 years and together with him for 17 he's very he's very sensitive to these things so whenever i i give him a wine that doesn't have good alcohol integration which a winemaker we would call hot he right. goes what the hell what happened what, you know and with the best lighter fluid too, the best thing too is i can smell it and i can usually taste it but he's actually my canary in a coal mine for smoke exposure and smoke taint 
his tongue explodes. And he's like, my tongue's exploding. This has smoked taint. We can't make this, you know, that sort of thing. So he's kind of the true North and the wine style that we create is kind of this sort of like romantic love project between a husband and a wife. And, and one of them's a little pickier than the other. And <laughs> we won't, okay. I was going to say, we won't answer which one, Yeah, uh, yeah. but we did. Mm -hmm. So he, did you like how he just ran off camera as fast as he could? He's just gone. <laughs> He's back. He's back. There it is. Well, well, what happens, Sean, when she wants to make a wine that she's passionate about and you're like, yeah, no, I don't like those wines. Um, well, that usually never happens. If she's passionate about it, we'll make it. And if okay. I was passionate about it, we would make it. We well, we do have a like he's my our teenage daughter just walked in the house to have a party. So we're gonna get on that. Um he um there have been situations where um we have the I've told you, I've told you and Denise about this, and I think I told the angels who visited us, but we have the big red project. Yep. The big red project we've been working on for for three years now. We're we're gonna make a big red. It's gonna happen. We're gonna make a big red. And, and then we go to the varieties that Lise wants to make a big red with. Okay, so there's that list. And then there's the varieties that Sean won't tolerate. So that list just got just just half <laughs> just gone. Half of that's gone. And so there's like more Vedras still living in there. And I'm really excited because if I was Spanish, I'd call it Monacel. You know, it's like I, I kind of want to hold on to more Vedra. So um, and then um, and then the crazy thing is Sean hates Cabernet Sauvignon, but he loves Cab Franc. As long as I don't give him an American Cab Franc, and I apologize to all American Cab Franc winemakers, but to him, it's too veggie. But once you put it in the Loire and you make it into Chenin and you make it all velvety and suddenly it's really rustic tannins are like, you know, kind of like black pepper to him, it suddenly makes sense. So, you know, I think our big red project someday may be a Morved or a Cab Franc, but who knows where we go. But, we, you know, we've been working on this project for three years and we haven't found the right situation yet. So. No, I, I love it. And do you ever do blind tastings and maybe sneak in a California cab front that surprise him or does he get it? Can you He's spot not, it? The, 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 um, IBMPs, the methoxypyrazines, uh, from California for California cab francs are so high that he usually freaks out. So it's very vegetal to him. And he's like, ah, you know, <laughs> like I did a rosé one time and I thought it would be lovely because it's a really cool hipster winery and I love these guys and they're great. And I gave it to him and he just like, he's like, what did they do? And I'm like, oh, sorry. So I'll, I'll come from Sean, Sean, the phrase super taster comes to mind. He mm. is. He really is. He's like, he's, a, but, and then he says he doesn't know what he's tasting, but he, but he will tell you if he doesn't like it. That's so, super cool. No, very good. Uh, a whiz, I've, I've been an asset in the kitchen as well with regards to sampling dishes and tasting things. And <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, he's a killer cook. He's yeah, a killer. Cook. I believe it. So, yeah. All right. So there's a there's a somewhere in the future there's a big red project. Uh, and yes. so since tonight's topic is rosé, I'm going to throw up a couple poll questions for the audience. And by the way, I'd be remiss if I said I was going to mention Jeff and Jane. I will mention Jeff and Jane because the quiz question: the Sanye process of making rosé involves what? And they correctly identified letter D, removing some of the juice during the maceration process when making red wine and then vinifying it separately, uh, often referred to as the free run juice. And Jeff and Jane will be having some uh, loyalty points deposited into their account, which I think they're saving up those points for reward redemption on another trip next year. Uh, that is an opportunity. So congratulations to Jeff and Jane. There are several people, by the way, that had the correct answer. It is also not only correct answer, but speed. And uh, they were the first ones in. So that's very important. So these poll questions, we're going to rip through these really quick. And uh, Sean, you're involved in the first one. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Who has the best dirt? A, oh. viticulturist, a viticulturist or a professional landscaper? I think professional landscapers have the best dirt because viticulturists, we like, we're stuck with what we get, but in his world, as a professional landscaper, he can change we it. We can make it happen. Yeah. So I'm going professional landscaper. The audience is on, oh, now it's switching. A lot of people changing their votes. <laughs> I'm going to end the poll right there. And the answer is 50-50. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we both won. Woo. Uh, you couldn't have planned that. Well done, team. Okay, the next question. This is actually for the audience. Uh, Lisa and Sean probably already know this. What variety is planted more in the Russian River Valley? Chardonnay or Pinot Noir? Hmm? 
Mark, hello to you. Sharice, I don't know if I said hello to you. Hello and welcome. All right. The answer is Pinot Noir. Oh, wow. It's like 47% to 30 something for Chardonnay, which shocked me. I actually thought it was Chardonnay and I am one of the people who, who should know this. So I seriously thought it was Chardonnay. <laughs> That's sad. Oops. Uh, all right, last question. And Lise should know this as well. Let's see. Rosé wine dates back to the founding of Marseille, France over 2,600 years ago. Phones down, people. I can see you. The release of Sutter Home White Zinfandel in 1972. Made to honor Pete Rose's lifetime ban from baseball in 1989. Pete Rose was his nickname. Fermented in Rome by monks for the Catholic Church in 50... I can't read my own, 50 AD. Honor system, no smartphones. I just want to pipe in as a Catholic that I highly doubt it was fermented in Rome by monks for the Catholic church in 50 AD because it does not have the octane that that church needs, right? Like they're going to be like a petite sera house and higher, right? Sheets are, that, I don't even know if that well, they could have been around. Like an alcohol. Nope. Uh, that's true. All right, here we go. The Wow, I don't have a tiebreaker because we've got nine people for Marseille and nine people, even with the hint that it wasn't going to be D. It's awesome. The Catholic Church. The answer is A. It was founded in Marseille by Romans, actually, over 2,600 years ago. They were making rosé in Marseille, France, right outside of Provence. So uh, pretty interesting how far back rosé goes. And the Sutter home, White Zinfandel, obviously that was kind of what put pink wine on the map, which we all know was a mistake, much like the post-it note and super glue and WD-40 and all the other things uh, made in the lab, but ultimately became a marketing phenomenon. And I think the founder of Sutter Home has four jets, homes on five different continents and has done quite well. Uh, no, actually, actually in, in the Trincaro family is wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful people. I, I absolutely love them. It's a fantastic company. So I've yeah. never worked for them, but, but they're amazing people, so. Uh, Jan has aced all three of them. Jeff allegedly correct on all three of them. Again, it's the honor system. And so you, you're going to have to take this to your grave. If you cheated on the Cellar Angel sip quizzes, that I, I don't know where you can hide. Sharice, I don't know if you've had my rosé sister, but I, I'm up to the challenge. I'm going to find a rosé you like. I'm going to do this. Yeah, I, I like that challenge. And in a couple seconds, Mission Control is going to turn on folks's, folks is now making up words, people's camera. So I uh, just want to, before Sharice, just so you know, there's a lot of folks in the audience right now drinking this rosé and you might be wondering how on earth did they do that? And they did it because they went to the Cellar Angels website and they went to the shop wine section and they were able to grab the sip kit. So obviously Lisa's wine is no longer in the sip kit. It was in the sip kit the last few weeks so that people could buy it in advance and sit down with her like we're doing this evening. So now this collection of Napa and Sonoma wines are going to be for the events August 5th through September 2nd. And I dare say I see a Scotland in there because I see six wines. And there, I'm, I'm sorry, Mission Control is informing that we have two Scotlands coming up. So uh, that'll be impressive. That's where we open up two bottles of wine. So Sharice, this would be a great place to grab your sip kit. And then every Friday night, you can tune in with the great owners of these wineries and learn a little bit more about the wine. Uh, there's plenty of other wines, all from Napa and Sonoma. You're not going to find these in stores. So this is a good place to go. And we'd love to have you. So now let's talk about rosé. So okay. excited. Stretch out, stretch out, skip, skip Okay, I'm good to go. Let's do it. Rosé, wine protection. Let's go. Yeah, I'm stretching because this is a big topic. Um, I'm going to come into it. I'm going to come. Oh, okay, let's go. How, how many different methods or are there of, of making rosé? Or what okay. are the top methods? So the top method, the top two methods that you're going to see in, in rosés that you buy from Cellar Angels or should you be walking down those, those forbidden, forbidden aisles? Um, and that will be sangre, which means sangre, 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 blood. So sangre, that means that there was a red wine fermentation that was occurring. We went into the tank and we, we bled off the top of the tank and it's a lighter wine with very minimal amount of skin contact time. And then we ferment that on its own. So that's a sangre production. And then there's- okay, wait, so let me, let me back up one second just from the mechanics of that. So mm -hmm. you 
you dump all the grapes into, go ahead. I dump all the grapes. I crush, crush the stem into a tank, okay? And then I do a rack and return. And the next day I go see it. And I'm like, oh, I need to concentrate this red wine fermentation down to make an even bigger, badder, darker, richer wine. Um, and so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna rack off from the top a bit of the liquid, which at that point should have a pleasing pink or salmon or copper color, uh, depending on what variety is the main variety that you're fermenting. And then I'm gonna pull that off into a tank and I'm gonna ferment that separately. And that's a Sagne. And that's okay. pretty common. Um, a lot of big houses, big cab houses, big Pinot Noir houses, they do that to concentrate their primary fermentation down. For dot wine, I do it on every lot I have if I need it, if I need it. So for instance, Lolita, which is a Cellar Angels wine, um, I do Sagne Lolita depending on the vintage and the year because I'm so small. I make all of those decisions in, in I, call, I, call it, I call it notable. I make those decisions. I give it, it's one of my tools, my toolkit. And I make that decision in, in the moment as I'm tasting those fermentations every single day. So that's so kind of- you literally, that's a game time decision. Yeah. That yeah. You, you go into the harvest and you don't know whether yeah. or not you're going to do it and you make it at the tank. Well, you know, I'm the geeky type. So there are clues. There are clues that I have, physiological clues from the vineyard that I have that I'm going into that are biasing this decision-making process, of course. It's totally impossible to make an unbiased decision make, you know, decision in winemaking. So, you know, I've been walking this vineyard every day during harvest. I've been walking this vineyard since pruning, you know, these sorts of things. I notice there's certain clues where I understand or know that there's a physiological coupling of phenolic development that's occurring, which is a lot of big words that basically means there are physical cues that that vineyard is giving me that are going to tell me that I have all the stuffing in this wine that I may not have to sagne as much. There's other okay. reasons we sagne as well. For instance, in the 2017 vintage, we all had massive heat spikes. I was aiming for 25 bricks to pick our Pinot Noir for Lolita. When I picked it in an emergency pick during a heat spike, it came across the scales at 28.5. Um, so I had to sagne and then water back just so I could for ferment and not have it taste like a port. So those Interesting. Things happen. Those things happen. So the, the sagne method, you don't know what you're going to do until you get there. Yes. No, it's Liz and Nelson. Uh, I, and Jeff's going to, Jeff's going to take care of them. That's good. So I, I love that aspect. Now you talk about cognitive bias or, or not making decisions. Do you ever? True cognitive bias. And it's funny because a lot of winemakers aren't, 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 um, they're not self-aware enough to understand that that decision making is happening. Where Correct. For me, as the winemaker, and especially usually, especially at a big place like Foley, I'm guiding you. You know, I'm your, I'm your spirit guide through the vineyard, right? That, that's my job. And um, it's kind of funny because I'm like, okay, so maybe you think that you need to pick this super ripe because we have a lot of unevenness because we had a bad spring, but the physiological cue. So, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, there's, yeah, it's, it's understanding people's biases and then also well, getting all that on my own. I was just going to say the other people that you're working for, that part I, I get, it's understanding yeah. their biases, but for you, you know, yeah. you've got someone over here on this shoulder, someone over here on this shoulder going, oh, this would make a killer rosé. No, no, no. So you stop talking. I need to get this over here. Oh, no, something is a killer rosé. It's great. Well, for, for us, the word different. So we're the second type of rosé. So we're the intentional rosé. Okay, let's talk about that. So we've got Sagne, which represents probably, you know, 70% of the market. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would easily say that. I would presume that yeah. it would be the, over the majority of the market. Yes. And so and then the, what's the second style of rosé? That's the essential rosé is that's where my, my path from my life as a big wine company girl kind of diverts. And that is um, I selected a vineyard located outside of Healdsburg, but is still within the Russian river Valley um, Appalachian. Um, one, it's a really nice family and I wanted to work with them, but two, it was strategic, uh, because it's a slightly warmer region. It's, it's off Balash road, right outside of town. And I thought, okay, if we have, you know, everyone knock on wood, um, three times, if we have another fire and smoke event, I can use this vineyard to my advantage. I, I was, and so I'm, I'm going to crop it for Rosé. So we let it, we, these are the things. So when you, when you, when you farm Pinot Noir for Rosé, it is literally uh, the opposite philosophy to farming kick-ass, gigantic, dark, deep, 
intense, amazing Pinot Noirs that are expressive. So you okay, so, you uh, laugh. So how, how did you how did you figure that out? You you well the, the twenty six vintages and you know, okay. twenty six not yet big fat degree and yeah. so um you have grapevine physiology blah 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 um so basically what we do is um I I need to have greater juiciness and I need to have a slower kinetic um pace from bloom to harvest I need to slow these vines down. And the best way to slow vines down physiologically is to weigh them down, which is crop. So I'm ballasting the physiological processes of this vine to ripen with crop. So I have big vine. Well, these vines happen to be big. So we have the big vines. They're old. They're about, they're, they themselves are 46 years old, which is kind of fun. Um, so big cool. vine ballasted with the amount of appropriate amount of fruit. And then the fertilization regime during the spring was basically all geared towards don't let these guys stress out. I want these ladies, I want fat ladies. I want fat, slow, chill. I'm on the beach getting rubbed, you know, with like a lovely coconut oil, like kind of chill moment. And I want them to swipe in as slowly as, po yeah, as slowly go, as possible. Go on. Yes. And so basically when that happens, then that gives me two things when I have slow, big, fat ladies. Okay. So, and I love this about them. One, I have time. So the worst thing on earth is when you're making an intentional rosé program and it's like your Sauvignon Blanc program. Sauvignon Blanc's a greyhound. It's a racehorse. I will go back to that vineyard and taste it every day, sometimes twice a day because it moves so fast on you because wow. the, the acids are polymerizing. I call Sauvignon Blanc the sprint during harvest. Okay. And so I have big fat ladies, they, they, they're ripening slowly. So things are happening on the order of two days at a time, not daily or half a day. So good. I need that. And then the other thing I'm dealing with as well is because of the slower kinetic ripening model and, 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 and mode, um, it's easier to control the acidity on it. I can make that call. I can say, okay, the, the flavor is developed now, but it's still a little tart. I want to hold off. I know I can maintain my flavor at a slightly lower acidity because I don't want to rip people's faces off with our rosé, right? Like I, I want it to be bright and beautiful acidity, but I don't want it to be like, you, now you don't need crest white strips because you, you have glow in the dark teeth. So right. it, those sorts of things, you kind of have to balance with it as well. The other principle that's really interesting with rosé is we pick them early. Uh, we pick them so early, in fact, that I was actually, I was, I was done. I was, I was off to neutral barrel for this program by the time I picked my first red Pinot Noir. So for me, that's great. Like I, I wanted an early region where I could get the Rosé program done. I have that done because I do have a day job, remember? And I wanted to be able to do it well, but I know with a day job, I can do one thing well at a time and I can't do multiple fermentations at a time. So it was really nice to kind of have that done. So it was, it was sort of perfect with regards to that. This particular site, they produce their own wine. It's called the Cobus Vineyard. Um, and, and the fact I tasted their red wines and I said, oh my goodness, you need, I need to do this as a rosé. It didn't come up in this wine as much. There's a hint to it that I pick up, but there's a grounding earthiness to this wine that's almost like a mushroom-like quality that I feel mm. makes this perfect rosé because it grounds it and makes it lovely. This rosé is really aromatic. It's super, super fruity tooty. It has so much watermelon and cherry and bright fruit. But All it right, hang on, stop. You're, you're, you're getting way ahead of the program notes. Yeah. Uh, right. You're on page four. We're, we have to go back to a couple of terms that go you back. said. Go back. Uh, polymerizing. Yeah. So acid. Phen phenolic ripeness. Every one of the angels knows phenolic ripeness because we discussed it with April Nall last week or two I weeks ago. Her. She's amazing. She's so great. Yes. Uh, April and Andrew talked, we all talked about tannins and phenolic ripeness. Now you also said ballasting. So do be us the favor, the polymerizing of the, I guess, long chain proteins and then the ballasting, not, not long chain protein. You go. It's the polymerizing of acid. So when we acid. have, so as during the ripening process, acid drops out, they call it dropping out of, yep. of the profile. It's not dropping out. It's not, it's, you know, you can't just have it disappear into the ether. It's actually- Trust me, the dropping out of acid, the dropping acid has been a reference yeah. for quite some time right. for any of the angels. There you are, there you are, good which is cool. Um, so, um, but the, um, so for this, this purpose, it's basically polymerization of acids to, to be more significant acid chains. And then you have less, um, less harsh acidities. Also, those are polymerized into other processes. Remember, cause yes. these are positive charged ions. 
So they're actually going on to many different parts of, of the ripening process and being pulled out of detection, if you will. Um, so when you make this wine, it's not nearly as tart. Um, so I'm looking for that polymerization. I'm not, not necessarily really looking for a really phenolically um, significant phenolics with regards to um, epicatechins, catechins, anthocyanidins, and tannins, right? So like, I'm not looking for massive structure, color, and bitterness in a, in a, in a rosé, but I am watching that, that acidity, like with like a hawk. And well, I, when I and you're talking specifically the acidity in the SB or in, okay. So that much or all of it. Yeah. And especially the rosé program. I'm watching the city in the rosé program like a hawk. It's actually one of the major drivers next to flavor profile, tasting the grapes in the field. I am watching those acidities so close. And I'm also um, analyzing the different the different types of acids that we have. So we can, we measure pH, which is fine. And then we measure, measure uh, total um, acidity or titratable acidities, which is great. But I'm also running panels behind my husband's back and paying cash for them because I don't want him to know because I can't hit the dot books for malic acid as well, which is really, this is also the dynamics of having a husband and wife team. Like the stuff I deal with at Foley is the same stuff I deal with with ownership on dot, except the only differences is I sleep next to him so yeah and so um, well, let's, he, well yeah. here's something that I love that you talked about with regards to the Pinot Vineyard where you said when you are making a rosé that's a designate rosé where you know in the spring we're making rosé from this vineyard so I know the winter not, I know in the winter, the winter. I in pruned, the winter. It for it. pruned for it right so it's not a it's not a circumstantial decision where you know, there was a problem with the harvest and it, the yield's not going to be X, Y, Z, like you thought. So we're just going to make rosé. Yeah, It's designed, you're, you're doing this in the winter, we're going to make rosé. So as Mission Control put in the chat, you know, it's a little bit more expensive because the red wine grapes are more expensive, it takes a little bit more labor of love. You have to start from the word go and it's not accidental knee jerk uh, game time decision or an audible, like you mentioned. But the thing that fascinated me is what you said with regards to, you have to slow this whole process down. And, and you want fat girls and you, you talked about ballasting or you talked about weighing them down. What is ballasting? So ballasting basically is taking the model of vine balance where you have this much crop <clears throat> being physiologically ripened by this much, you know, this much vigor, okay? Or green growing parts. So, you know, leaves, gains, whatever have you. <clears throat> ballasting is purposely leaving more fruit on that vine so that the ripening process is slowed down. So I need to balance the, the physiological development of this vine. I need to pull it back. I don't right. want it to ripen. I don't want it to gain bricks and lose acid quickly because I have to be able to figure out every step of the way when we're gonna pick. I'm slowing it down. Okay, so I'm picturing it in my head as almost the opposite of dropping fruit where you want more vigor to go to the remaining clusters. Or is oh, no. I'm a, I'm a major pain in the ass in vineyards. I, I didn't get this far in my career without being a, 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 a hideously painful, cruel, but fair perfectionist. So, oh no, we did a green drop on this one two weeks prior okay. to, yeah, no, we, we don't know. It's a, this is, this is a very designer rosé that was made very, very designer. So two weeks prior to Verizon. So before we even have color, I went through with the team and we actually dropped out fruit because I did need enough phenolic development and flavor development to occur. So this is not an overcropping exercise. If this Got was it. an okay. overcropping exercise, everybody in the Big Valley would make the most kick and rosé on earth. No, this, this is very painstaking, lots of data, lots of, uh, the grower, uh, there were a couple trust issues with the grower, where the grower was like, we're dropping so much crop, it's a rosé program, I thought we need more crop for rosé. And I'm like, you do, but you don't, sit down and I'll tell you why. So it was one of those, it, it, was, it was very much, yeah, and there they actually made a rosé off of this vineyard, the owner, in their to their own label, Cobus Vineyard, Cobus Winery, and yep. then another buddy of mine made his own rosé off of the same vineyard called Drive Wine. So all three of us were making a rosé, and everybody agreed like this rosé was just so incredible, beautiful, and the three of us made it in such dramatically different styles from each other. Oh, super cool! Well, I do want to. You mentioned Verasion a second ago, and I want to show that because the expert, Hi. the expert taster in your family was able to send us this picture today. Okay, so why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit about what's happening here? 
All right. So um, what's happening here is kind of interesting. Um, this is so it's a little what you actually took a picture of is something usually Sean points out to me because I have to deal with. So this didn't happen. So just full disclosure, we're not working with this vineyard this year. OK, and okay. it's not it wasn't because it wasn't good quality. It's because I I I'm the horrible slut and I've moved on to another vineyard. Um, so <laughs> leave it on me. Um, All right. We just got our our our. Um... NR17 rating. So yeah, use, them, use them and lose them. Use them and lose them, people. Um, so um, I just because we're working on a new pro okay. So I think we told you we're working on a on a um a Beaujolais Nouveau project. And so I, I need to because we're so small and we're mom and pop and we literally bootstrap all of our programs, like everything's from our our paychecks. Um we're making a, a Beaujolais Nouveau that we're gonna release and um and so I needed to use a vineyard that we could use that with and have a better price point. This is honestly too expensive a vineyard to work with with this project. Right. So what you're seeing here is crowding um, at the terminus, at the head or terminus of the vine, which is really annoying. So that would have happened last year. It didn't happen last year. They actually had to address any clusters that were touching or crowding in this capacity. Where you're seeing on the top left is actually that white stuff is not mealybug. That's residue, that's spray residue, which actually makes me happy because we've had um, that's a pre, that was a pre bunch closer spray that the grower did that they had never done until last year. Cause I, I taught them that trick. So super excited about that. You're also seeing uneven Verizon at this point in time, the level of quality of, of any, any wine program you do is directly related to how quickly you go through your major phenological events. So bloom this year, we had a really short bloom. We were anywhere from seven to 10 days. <clears throat> Verays on this year, we're also seven to 10 days. So if you guys are into, if you're betting, the betting folk, um, the 2022 vintage for Russian River Valley Pinot Noir should be exceptional because of the fact that we have been able to race through these phenological events so quickly. Well, the and then you talk about the uneven cluster ripening. It looks like this cluster's done. Yeah. This one's 75% of the way there. Right. And that one's 50. Yeah, 50 and 75 okay. or whatever. Yeah. So when you when you walk through a vineyard and see this, what does it immediately tell you? Well, this in this year, I know for a fact that this vineyard probably initiated um, Verizon probably about five days ago. It's been hot. Yeah. It's been hot. And right. so um, I it's racing through. Um it's 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 you know when you you know when you take like a picture of somebody and they're like mid-smile and it's like, you know, it's like an awkward. Uh, that's this pic. That's a very, this is an awkward raise on picture for this one where like it's, it's, you know, they were in mid, mid, mid stride, or mid smile, if you will. Um, yep. And this will most likely finish, um, finish through probably by the end of this weekend. And then that grower, they like to drop, they like to do a green drop on the end as well. So I call it the bookend. So we, we eliminate all the clumps, make sure that we have good vine balance heading into Verizon. So the initiation of Verizon, all, all of the phenolic development that's occurring during Verizon only goes to the fruit that we are retaining for our program. Um, so we have sort of, it's kind of like, the, you know, you eat a pack berry, it's like super juicing your phenolic development. And then we, at the end, we catch the greens and pull those out as well. Um, on my higher end Pinot Noir programs, I've never done this for Dot because I just am not ready to be that level of cruelty. But for <laughs> other wine companies, I have given Cruz forks and we have forked out green berries. Ooh. I'm that person. You're the person that makes the crew walk through the vineyard and fork out green berries. Yeah, which started on my team, the term go fork yourself. Yeah, I can only imagine how yeah, well that, you received. That was Cab. That was Cabernet Sauvignon, and that made a 96-point wine that year. So it, it's, couldn't it's you, yeah. Couldn't you do it on the sorting table? You can, but the whole time from Verizon now to harvest, that vine is physiologically spending itself to calibrate for those berries. By the way, on right. that table, those berries, everybody looks black. Everybody's oh, black. Okay. Gorgeous. That's a good point. Dark fruit. Good dark point. fruit. It's not going to show up then. So, and I knew that that was coming in and it was a really high end, you know, and we, we got a 96 on that project. So that was really exciting. It was the Eleanor blend for Coppola. So I was pretty stoked. But All right, we've got Sonia, we've got Designate, and there's also blended rosés. What are those? Yes, and so um, that technically is what, uh, oh, blend, the true blended is when you take a white and a red wine and you go, and I made a rosé. I'm not kidding. There, that's So when you do, when you get wines that are in like the jug, like not the high-end jug and not the hipster box, like the old box, like, you know, when you were in college and you, and you had the box, that that's a blended wine, just so you know. So usually it's a white wine, it's a white wine base, and then they blend in enough, either concentrate, God help us all, um, <laughs> or, 
Sorry, I just <laughs> get behind me, Satan. Um, so that, that doesn't happen at DOT, but you know, I've, I've heard of the lower end programs doing these things. Um, and yep. then they'll blend in a red wine. That's a blended wine. So for Cobus, what you have here is, um, is, a, is, a, is a middle-aged Asian mom who overthinks everything on DOT everything. That's my job is I'm going to overthink dot. I'm going to do. So we made Cobus as a gorgeous intentional rosé and she is beautiful. There is so much aromatic, um, jumps out of the glass. It's very aromatic. It's beautiful. There's this long finish that kind of stays with you the whole time. Like I always love to say the best wine that you have, you smell it after you've swallowed. Like it's just, it's just this beautiful organoleptic kind of communication that's happening and it's enticing and it brings you in. Like that's this wine. And I, I worked very hard to get this. I, it's, I over-research all my yeast regimes. I over-research everything. So we, we did it and I'm tasting it on the bench without Sean in the room, because he's not allowed to be there in these moments, because I love that man, but it's just better. Um, so then, um, so I'm tasting it, and I taste it, and I, I love the aromatics, I love the integrity, I love the acidity, I love the finish, but she's hollow. And people may love to look at a supermodel, but you don't love to drink a supermodel. You know, that hollowness inside of tank fermented wines um, it, it, it's, it's, it's palpable and I don't like it. Um, and at our level, the level that we strive for with dot wine, it's about making the most beautiful and excellent wines that we can that please Sean Phillips, our co your co-founder, but also, you know, we're sitting on 26 years. Well, if you have my master's program, we're sitting on what, like 30 years worth of, of research data, um, and, and, right. and farming practices and winemaking practices. And so you use every single tool you have. So I was well, and just not just like you said, uh, research data is one thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, practical. it's in the field on the job training yeah. type of stuff. It's not all just book. Yeah. And, and that's where the street sense or street smarts come in. So yeah. totally and I, I'm scrappy. Cool. I'm scrappy. And so I'm, look, I'm tasting this wine and, and, and the facility winemaker where I crush all our wines at Jay Rickards winery up in Cloverdale. They're awesome. He's like, this is beautiful. And I was like, yeah, but she's a, she's a hollow skinny supermodel. And I want luscious, beautiful, fleshy, weighty. You're going to drink this rosé all year long. And I was kind of like, this doesn't make sense. I said, hold on. And so I ran into the cellar. We grabbed samples of every, every Sanye barrel we had. We chose a selection, which of course was our most expensive Sanye program, period. Because usually we just sell those. We just sell them off. Um, and we selected it and we blended it back. So we chose all three vineyard designate vineyards we work with. We, we took a little Lyric which is um, Santa Rosa Plain. We took a little Rhone, which is Green Valley. And we took a little Lolita, which is Green Valley. So just big baller Beverly Hills kind of zip codes, kind of Pinot Noir programs. Pulled those Sonia programs out from neutral oak barrels, did a blending trial and came up with this. And it's perfect in my opinion. It has that weight. It has a middle, it has a juiciness. I, I would ha be happy drinking this in November with my butternut squash or my turkey. Um, but yeah, also, it's, I will it's still 85 degrees in November where you are. Well, uh, yes and no. So I, I would sort of enjoy that. Um, but you know, that's that's sort of that year. I wanted I wanted a rosé with, 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 with balls, you know, and I, I so we did this and the best tell was Sean tried it. And he's like, what did you do to our rosé? And I was like, I just, I just, just, just hang with me here. And he tasted it and it was- I really gave the supermodel some balls. I gave the supermodel a middle because, you know, it's like, it's, I just gave her a middle. And, and it was really interesting because Sean said, this is so complex. This is so complex. I'm like, so is it like, is it like interesting? Like, and you know, when people say like, oh, interesting. And you know, they're lying to your face because they don't really think you're interesting. They just think you're wrong. And it, and it was more of like, this is so, this is so interesting. It's so complex. There's so many layers to this. And I was like, good. <laughs> so it was fun. And, and then we, we, we did what we don't like to do, which is we submitted it to a couple competitions and it's just been racking up hardware. And what I realized, oh, nice. what I realized was, is that it is a, it is a grittier, it's not a phenolic or big um, rosé, but it has so much interest and so much structure that people are in, in a competition, it's worthy. So it's kind of, it's been fun to kind of work with this. I, I do think I'm going to be making rosés forever uh, at dot in the style because it, it really I is like it. the best of both worlds. Um, Good. Let me, let me show folks where you are. So you talked about Russian River. Actually, you mentioned, if I can go back to the tape, baller Russian River. 
So um, this is the Russian River AVA, a rather large AVA, one of the larger AVAs in both Napa and Sonoma, uh, but it also has sub AVAs in it. And we're gonna get more detail on Google Earth because Sean's like, I gave him the address. That is not what I sent him. Um, so, and I, I concur. So let me show you some Google Earth because I know Jeff, I'm surprised uh, Jeff has not actually been screaming for it. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about with regards to where DOT is and, and actually how we found them because it's a special different place. First of all, for those of you that are new, Lise talks about her playground and, and this is our playground. So we focus strictly on the Napa and Sonoma region. And one of the reasons why we focus on this is because it's just essentially an unprecedented tapestry of soils, of climates and microclimates. And Lisa talked about mesoclimates earlier, which is another word I was going to have her define. Uh, but this is where we play. Six of the 12 soil regions in the world are within these two counties. And it is a very, very special place. But equally as a special from a wine loving standpoint and where we spent considerable hours last week is this little tasting collaboration called Bacchus Landing. So in the wonderful enclave of Healdsburg uh, is just on the outskirts. I'm trying to move some pictures around. From here's downtown Healdsburg. The square is like right there. You move over here to Bacchus Landing. It's less than a mile. Uh, but here in Bacchus Landing is the dot tasting room among a couple other tasting rooms. And it is, this doesn't really give it justice because this is an open courtyard. And you walk through this beautiful gate over here, which is the gate behind me. And in here, you have this beautiful Spanish pseudo almost hacienda type environment that is just so laid back, so chill. And there's several tasting rooms in here and you can just walk from one to another. Uh, and these aren't stacked five people deep at the tasting room. They're staffed expertly by individuals that are passionate. Uh, Lisa's often there, the owners are often there, Sean is often there, and you can sit down, relax, and learn in depth about everything happening at this winery. And it, it is fantastic from a standpoint of exposure and getting up close and personal and learning uh, at the ground level from the people making the wine. Now, the Cobus Vineyard is also right outside of Healdsburg. So, if, if I pan back a tad, here you have the Russian River. So you can imagine hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of erosion, evolution, overflowing, receding, overflowing, receding, and the different soil content here in these vineyard blocks uh, right off the Russian River. But equally as impressive is the ability to actually see these vines up close and personal. <laughs> So this was when we were there working day, uh, joking, this was not when we were there. Uh, but I like, you could see it in the picture of, of Verasion that we showed. I mean, these are some old vines. You, what'd you say, at least 46? They're 46. So you were actually the same age. The vineyard was planted in 1976 when I was the year I was born. Okay, so they're mature. And I, I find it economically fascinating that they're still there at 46, uh, but it is Pinot Noir country. So here you are in the valley floor, Pinot Noir, heaven, uh, Mecca, if you will. And, and this is the Cobus Vineyard. So that is where the Pinot Noir that you're drinking is from. And as she indicated, she did not make a Pinot Noir, I'm sorry, a rosé from this vineyard this year. Uh, but the Cobus in my glass is the 2021. And you talked a little bit about aromas. I want you to touch a little bit on pairings with this. Well, for us, um, keep in mind, you know, we're Filipino American family with a lot of strong Hawaiian roots. So th this is our, this is our poke wine. So when we were making ahi, ahi, ahi tuna, tuna poke, you know, poke is the best one to go for. Um, we love it spicy. We love a lot of chili and a lot of chili sauce in it. So a lot of sriracha and a lot of um, uh, you know, a lot of kind of heavier kind of chili kind of content is, is kind of how we roll with that. The other thing I love about this rosé though is because it's balanced with regards to its alcohol integration, its acidity, and its flavor profile, 
it goes so well with you know things that would be everyday like garnitas tacos right or it would go lovely um with um you know a beautiful piece of salmon like it, so these sorts of things i really feel like it's very versatile i'm not normally a fond of like a burger with rosé kind of thing but i do think there's enough structure on this rosé that you could pull it off um i do think a salmon burger would pull off very nicely with it um mm. we tend to drink rosé our family drinks rosé all year long so that's kind of what we do. Um, and, and a lot of the, the flavor profiles from this rosé, I think would pair so nicely, especially with that Thanksgiving meal, you know, up ahead. Thanksgiving, I feel is like the Super Bowl of wine and food pairings because it's just chaos. You know, there's, there's fatty things and there's different types of meat and there's right. things, yep. and nothing matches and there's creamy things. So I feel like this sort of, this sort of wine would, would, would do quite well with that as well. Is there anything you'd stay away from as it relates to pairing this? See, I love rosé and we've all, our family, we've always had rosé. So I, I don't, I mean, yeah, I mean, in the rare, like once a month, I have a ribeye. Like, I don't think I'd open a rosé with a ribeye. I'd open, right. you know, it's, yeah, that's kind of, for me, the ribeye is kind of like, you know, I make a wine called the player. I, I drink the player with that, or I drink the zen I make with that. So, you know, Got it. or, or I'd, I'd crack open an, an Aldina cab. God, I love those wines. Those are amazing. So I'd have one of those. You'll be drinking that alone because Sean doesn't drink cab. Well, the funny thing is he will drink the Aldina cab. And I think part of it is again, um, is a, a cognitive bias. He loves the Lopez family, right? Right. We're in the whole point that Dot has representation in this amazing place to visit at Bacchus Landing is because of the Lopez family. So one, like, how can you not like super love that, right? That's but then on top of that, they have, um, their alcohol actually is not lower. Oh, Sean's right. is lower alcohol. And so their alcohol is better integrated. And these are the things where we can trick Sean. If I have to make a higher alcohol wine <laughs> by just having greater phenolic development. and like, We're going to go to helps. commercial while Sean and Lise will settle this. And then w when we come back, <laughs> no, go ahead. So um, I think a lot of it's that. And then the other thing about the Aldina cab that I love is that fact it's, it's um, their winemaker is another, it's, she's another, it's a woman, her name's Belen Seha and she's so talented. But what they do, what she does is, which I feel that like we're very similar in our winemaking styles where it's a lot of very high integrity winemaking where, look, I'm not going to add acidity to this. I picked it right. You know, if I blow it, I, I've blown it before and I will add back acid, but I don't need to if I picked it right. And so for them, they pick their estate vineyard with good good acid balance and she pays as much attention to acid profiles and spends as much money as i do on um on uh on lab laboratory analysis that she doesn't have to hide from her husband but but i have to really hide from mine understood uh we'll we'll edit that part out so when sean watches it it won't be there so uh yeah. that'll be fine i i love this rosé and if i can steal a phrase from you this is a kick in rosé it has all of the elements of a kick and rosé does have the notes on the nose in the beginning. It, it, the bouquet is awesome. It leaps out of the glass and it's not overpowering or over flowery or over perfumey or anything like that. It, it just has complexity. It has the minerality, but also on the palate that you talked about earlier, it, it does have not a candied sweetness, but you do get fruit from a watermelon aspect to it and a berry aspect to it. Uh, and it is just absolutely delicious, complex. And to your last point, the acid is there. It just rings through the finish. It's perfectly integrated, wonderfully balanced. And this is, you're right, for those of us in Florida or hot climates, this is an all year round wine, a, a patio pounder for that is quite elegant and beautiful. So congratulations on this wine. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, any other questions for Lise? Because we've kept her past the allotted time. And uh, that is amazing because we were certain that this was going to go long. And I would like to thank Lise. I would like to thank Sean. Can't wait to hear about the Beaujolais program. Uh, that's exciting as I'll get out. Uh, next week, we have a surprise guest, a former employee of ours. I refer to her as a sister from another mister. And she is also a chef and a sommelier. And she is coming to us live from Oregon to talk about how you can order wine with confidence at a restaurant and understand and speak with the sommelier and the wine steward and press your guests and not make any mistakes. Uh, it's a easier thing said than done. So we're gonna give you the skills and tips to do that. Uh, Megan is her name. We can't thank Sean and Elise enough. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can't thank all of you. Angels, you're the best. Uh, be good to one another. Kindness wins at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Mahalo. Cheers. Bye.
Mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha, everybody.